In this video, we want to take a look at a chi-squared test for independence. So let's take a look, look at the example here. Mr. Mays has collected the following data about his student's handedness and eye color. Does it appear that the two traits are independent of each other? Now I want to point out that this is a test for independence and I know it's a test for independence because I have one sample that I've collected and I'm looking at two variables, eye color being one variable and their handedness being another, uh, another variable. So I'm checking to see if they are independent of each other. Well, there's the data that we have, so let's start to go through the test. The first thing I want to do is write my hypotheses, my null hypothesis for a test for independence is basically just this. The traits eye color and handedness are independent. So any kind of high, for any kind of test for independence, your null hypothesis is going to say that your two variables are independent of each other. <clears throat> Consequently, the alternative hypothesis will say that the traits eye color and handedness are not independent. Very basic. It's a test for independence. So your null says that the two uh, that the two variables are independent, and your alternative says that the two color or the two uh, variables are not independent. So as I continue here. I'm going to check my assumptions and conditions. The first assumption that I'm going to check is counted data. So each one of these is counted data. I had six people that were left-handed and had brown eyes, 36 people that were right-handed and had brown eyes. So that is counted data and that condition has been satisfied. My next condition that I need to look at is my randomization condition. Now, it doesn't tell us that this was randomly collected data, but I want to know, does this represent my population? So what I have to ask myself is, does Mr. do Mr. Mays' students represent the population of all people? Well, I'm going to go ahead and assume that they are. So I would want to write something that says, let's, we will assume that this sample represents the population. And then finally, the last condition that we have is the expected cell frequency. And what we're looking for with an expected cell frequency is <clears throat> we're looking to make sure that every expected value is greater than or equal to 5. So <clears throat> in order to check this condition, I have to make sure that I, I have to go ahead and find the expected values. In order to find the expected values for this type of table, I want to take the row total, multiply it by the total that I have in my column, and then divide that by the total that I have in the table. And I'm looking at the total, um, the total number of counts for each of those. So let's find the totals in the table here. When I look here, 6 plus 36 is 42, 7 plus 26 is 33, 2 plus 21 is 23, and 4 plus 12 is 16. When I take 6 plus 7 plus 2 plus 4, that gives me 19 for my total in that column, and then 36, 26, 21, and 12 gives me a sum of 95. So the table total ends up being 114. In order to find the expected value, let's go. Well, let's just go ahead and look at the expected value for this particular um, cell: left-handed and brown eyes. I'm going to go ahead and put a little slash here. The number on the left is going to be the observed value, and I'll write the expected value over here on the right. So to find the observed or the expected value there, I take 42, because that is because that is the total amount in my row and multiply that times 19, which is the total amount in that column, and then divide that by the total amount in the entire table, which is 114. That ends up giving me exactly 7. So 7 is going to be my expected value there. Let's go ahead and do the next one. I'll do one more, and then I've already done the math ahead of time, so I'll just go ahead and fill in the rest. But let's take right-handed people with brown eyes. We would expect what in that case? Well, <clears throat> let me get rid of this one. Whoops. Let me erase this, give myself some space. And let's go with the row total, which is 42, right here. The column total, which is 95, so multiply those two together. And divide by the total for the entire table, which is 114. And that ends up giving me 35. So the expected value for this cell is 35. Now, like I said just a second ago, I've already got the, uh, I've already done the math. So I'm going to go ahead and put all of the other expected values in here. And I want to make note that with these expected values, you should not round off to the nearest whole number. 
7 and 35, when you do the math, it actually comes out to, turns out to be a whole number. But for the rest of these, I end up getting decimals. 5.5 there, 27.5 here, 3.83 for this expected value, 19.17 for this expected value, 2.67, and then 13.3 here. I would encourage you to go ahead and double check my work, make sure that I've done everything correct, and that'll give you a little bit of practice on finding these expected values. So just one more example, 13.3 13, 13 comes from 16 times 19 divided by 114, and that gives you 13.3. So there's my expected value. As you can see, each one of these expected values is more than 5, therefore the expected cell frequency condition has been satisfied. Let's continue the test. Now that I know every, all the conditions have been met, I can name my test and a couple other things. Since the assumptions and conditions have been met, we will conduct a test for independence. We established that in our null hypothesis. And this is going to have three degrees of freedom. Now just to talk about the degrees of freedom very quickly here, degrees of freedom is found by taking the number of rows minus 1 and multiplying that times the number of columns minus 1. So in this case if I scroll down a little bit I had 1, 2, 3 rows, brown, blue, green and other, excuse me, 4 rows and I have 2 columns. So when you do the math here you have 4 rows, 4 minus 1, 2 columns, 2 minus 1, that's 3 times 1 which is 3 and that's where my 3 degrees of freedom comes from. Now that I've named the test, I can go ahead and find the test statistic. So the formula that I'm going to use in order to find my test statistic, which is chi-square, is right there. Now I also want to point out, this is called chi-squared. It's not chi-squared. It's not chi-squared. It's not chi-squared. It's chi. It sounds like a K. So chi-squared, the chi-squared formula for your test stat is right there. Now this formula says to take the observed values minus the expected values, square that difference, and then divide by the, ex the expected value. Once you find all of those for each one of your cells, you then add them all together. This symbol right here means find the sum. So I'm going to find the sum. So here we go. <clears throat> For left-handed left people that have brown eyes, the observed was 6 minus 7, the expected value. I'm going to square that, and after I square that, I'm going to divide by 7. So there's the work for that particular cell. 6 minus 7, the observed minus the expected. Square the difference, divide by 7, and that gives you that particular, uh, that, that gives you that particular calculation for this particular cell, left-handed with brown, brown eyes. And I just continue to do that. Right-handed with brown eyes is 36 excuse me, 36 minus 35, divided by, or find the difference, square the difference, divide by 35, and there it is right there in my formula. I continue to do this for every single cell until I get down to the very last one, 12 minus 13 squared, divided by the expected value, 13.3. Once I find all of these values, I add them all together. And when I add them all together, that gives me my chi-squared value. So here we go. Let's get rid of this. And there's my chi-squared. I've done the math ahead of time. Saves us some time. If you want to double check everything, go ahead and do that on your own. But right here is our chi-squared value of 2.51. That's our test statistic. Now, how do we use that test statistic? Well, we use the test stat to find a p-value. If you've gotten this far into a course, you're probably familiar with p-values. So I'm going to show you how you can find your p-value using your calculator. Let me pull my calculator up here. And on this calculator, I am going to use, I'm going to go stat, no, nope, excuse me, I'm going to go second vars. And I'm going to scroll down to chi-squared CDF. This is a function that gives us the area under a chi-squared distribution curve. So for me, it's number eight. Make sure you use chi-squared CDF and not chi-squared PDF. So chi-squared CDF is what I'm going to use. <clears throat> and with chi-squared uh, CDF, I want to first put in my uh, chi-squared value. And if we remember, let's come back here, my chi-squared value was... 2.51, so I'm going to plug 2.51 in right here, 
2.51. And then I'm going to go all the way to my right hand boundary, which is 999. Now you just pick, just pick a large value. I like to pick 999 as long as my uh, test statistic isn't larger than that. And then the last thing you need to give this, fu this function on your calculator is your degrees of freedom. If you remember, our degrees of freedom was 3. Once I plug all that in, I hit enter, and there is my p-value, 0.473. So let's go back to uh, our other page, 0.473 is our p-value, and let's write that down. p-value is equal to 0.473. Now, the one thing that I did not establish earlier was my level of significance. The most common level of significance is alpha equals 0.05. So I'm going to go ahead and use that as my level of significance. Knowing that, I can now make a decision about my null hypothesis. <clears throat> what I see here is that since my p-value is more than my alpha 0.05, I will retain the null hypothesis. And since I'm going to retain the null hypothesis, now I need to say something about the claim, which is the alternative. So here, my alternative said that they were, if you remember, the null hypothesis said that the two are independent. So if I go back all the way to my hypotheses right here, the traits eye color and handedness are independent. Well, I just said that I was going to, based on the p-value, retain the null hypothesis. So I then can say there is not enough evidence to support the claim that eye color and handedness are not independent. So the first thing that I say is something about the null hypothesis and then the next thing that I say is something about the claim and most of the time if the way that, the, that you set things up is the claim is the alternative so there is not enough evidence to support the alternative which says that eye color and handedness are not independent so hopefully this helps you uh, perform a, a chi-squared test for independence and have fun in your stats class